Thanks, Graham. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first industry panel for the FECE 2020. I'm uh, really glad to be able to connect with all of you and have the chance to moderate uh, such a panel of distinguished contributors. Um, we have about an hour together. And uh, what I'd like to do is to systematically uh, introduce each panelist, uh, invite them to share their unique perspective uh, for a couple of minutes with each of us. So that will take us about maybe 30, 40 minutes. And after that, we keep about 15, 20 minutes where we can go into a group Q&A discussion and we'll be happy to take questions from the floor. And you can use the Q&A uh, button to log in your questions and I'll do my best to uh, share and direct them to the audience, uh, to the panelists. Okay, so let's get started. I'm very happy to uh, maybe invite comments from our first panelist, Mr. Chris Way. So to you know, update and share more about Chris. So Chris is the global chairman for Aviva Digital and executive chairman for Aviva Asia. He leads Aviva's global drive in digital and has really transformed you know, the 321 year old insurer into a leading insure tech disruptor. Now Chris also manages Aviva's operations across Asia and has been very active in driving initiative that are really bringing change for businesses, customers, employees, and other key stakeholders across the region. Uh, prior to his time at Aviva, Chris was the group CEO of Great Eastern Holdings and was very responsible for successfully growing their business and entrenching their leadership position in Singapore and Malaysia. So Chris, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, as our first speaker, as uh, you know, a, a digital leader, uh, can you share with us your perspectives around how COVID has been changing demand for insurance uh, in the market? And also, there's always a typical perception that insurance is a high-touch, very personalized business. And as an early leader in digital, can you share what are some of your learnings, especially on the cultural front? You know, oftentimes people talk about the technology side of change. I think the cultural side of change is important. And how did you bridge the culture uh, between incumbents and the digital natives? Thank you, Chris. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. And, and good morning, Michael. Good morning to all the participants. And let me first thank SBF for inviting me to be part of this very important conference. Um, as the organizers load my slides, I'll just maybe start with the first question. Um, COVID had had a very fundamental impact to our business. And um, on, the, on the plus side, it's actually raised a lot of awareness for our customers around the importance of being protected and buying insurance. So awareness has grown. Um, of course, on the flip side, when you have lockdowns and social distancing, our advisors are not actually able to meet our customers face to face. And it was really interesting learning over the last six months. If I use China as the first example, Hubei province represents about 15% of our business in China. We have a joint venture with Kofco. And um, we had already built out our digital platform on Tencent's WeChat infrastructure. So we had all the advisory tools ready, but not all of our advisors were using it. And stealing the line from Minister Chan, we took advantage of the crisis. We actually trained all of our advisors digitally. 100% of our advisors took up the training. We had about a 20% drop uh, in the next couple of months in terms of top line, but actually 97% of our business was transacted fully digitally. So it, it sort of taught us, uh, you know, there are different ways to meet our customers' needs and all paradigms can definitely be broken down and, and reinvented. So that, that's absolutely in line with the intent of this conference. Um, if I can uh, move on to the next slide and, and sort of give a bit of an introduction to Aviva Digital. Our board five years ago understood that we needed to separate our digital and innovation practice from the rest of our business. And we, you know, so my title actually, it's a totally separate legal entity with separate governance, separate funding. And that was very intentional. And I think for a lot of businesses that are trying to embark on a, a digital journey, um, you will understand as an owner or as a person that runs a business, organizations have limited bandwidth to do change. And this is even before I touch culture. 
is just how much money a, a company will have, big or small, to allocate towards something new and the impact to the existing business and infrastructure is material. So for Aviva, we needed to separate it. If I can go to the next slide, please. And I'm just showing a few years of, of history here. Um, but we started off very much on functional improvement. We probably spent too much time, too much money on design. Um, and then we, we gradually, after the first year, realized you can build a fantastic website. It doesn't change your business. That's table stakes to make the experience relatively seamless. So then we, we began to think about propositions that would impact the differentiation elements of what Aviva offered. So we began to build out more unique aspects um, of our build. Um, you know, three years in, we actually started to make an impact. And in the UK, for example, a pension customer of ours can see everything around their savings for retirement. They can do fund switches. Uh, a lot of UK customers have pensions with other companies. We made it a one buck button to decide to consolidate your pension savings onto the Aviva platform making things really easy and frictionless for customers allowed us to grow our business quite rapidly. If I can move to the next slide. But actually it took us a few years to figure out um, what was our core capability to actually differentiate a sustainable strategy. And uh, Aviva and insurance is, uh, it's quite a technical industry. Um, a lot of it's driven by understanding customer behavior, understanding the fundamentals of our business. And we created uh, something new a couple of years ago called Quantum. Quantum is Aviva's data analytics practice. I'm sure through the course of the day, you're gonna hear a lot about the importance of data management. I can tell you this is absolutely the currency that fuels our strategy around innovation and digital. But we needed to create a construct that actually organized the business to think through what we could apply it for Otherwise, you can run in 10,000 different directions and actually waste a lot of effort. So we organize quantum and actually digital along three verticals. The first vertical is actually understanding how data can impact the core fundamentals of our business. So we use data, of course, for underwriting to understand risk. We use it for claims. So um, we wanted to, again, make it frictionless for a customer to be, to be able to submit a claim. We're very, very proud to, to meet our promises and pay claims but it would be counterintuitive and actually um, relationship destructive if we made it really difficult for a customer to claim. So we put in a lot of analytics to make it seamless for you, uh, whether it's using natural language processing to read reports, uh, whether it is using technology so you can easily take photographs of damage um, or build out API so that we could link to uh, sources of, of data so that you can fulfill your claim. Let's say, connecting with the clinic, uh, which has provided your medical services. Um, so a, a lot of that is just fundamentally what we do, but we wanted to make it very almost pleasurable if that's possible for you to deal with your insurance company. The second vertical is very important for all business, which is operational efficiency. Uh, I'm quite proud to say that Aviva Singapore has one of the lowest expense ratios in the industry. And it's because we've used technology to simplify and to streamline all of our operational processes. Now, you don't automate anything unless you've actually fundamentally rethought your process. Um, and it's a skill set that needs to be built. It is talent that you may not have in your organization. Uh, but don't digitize an inefficient process. That, that again, would be counterintuitive. So it does require quite a broad skill set. Um, and then it's breaking down which bits of capability you should be building as proprietary IP and which bids are easily bought because it's now commoditized. So Minister Chan talked about natural language processing. There's multiple companies that provide that capability. It's a very rules-based engine in its traditional form. There's no point rebuilding that. So I would say an NLP engine should be acquired through partnership, collaboration, or you just buy it as a service. And that's what we did. The IP bit is actually the rules that sit on top. So we have a set of rules that allow us to read medical reports for health underwriting. We have a set of rules that read legal reports for litigation claims. We have another set that do it for commercial broker submissions, et cetera, et cetera. That bit is the proprietary capability and you need to have the skill set that focuses on the bit that will be unique to yourself. The last bit is the one that I have the most fun with, which is 
how do you leverage data and analytics for growth? Uh, this needs to be linked to your strategy. You need to understand really the nuances of what you're trying to achieve. So one small example, we have a digital joint venture with Tencent and Hill House Capital in Hong Kong. We use analytics to understand our customer behavior digitally. Now this is of course with their uh, permission. So if we give the customer good reason to share some of their information with us, so the proposition has to be strong, we have to earn their trust in order for them to share some of the details of their digital experience online. But we realize that for insurance anyway, it's not like retail digital commerce. Um, we're not selling iPhones, we're not selling Beats headphones that people want naturally. They're looking for it online. For insurance, we needed to do it differently. And we realized through analytics that for a bunch of our customers, it's not one ad, it's not five. It could be 50 to 70 touch points through a variety of different um, content providers. So we had a full range of, of centers of excellence, influencers that we use in Hong Kong. We used a little bit of digital uh, above the line. We use Google search, of course, and, and Facebook. But the bit that was most interesting we also partnered with Tencent for gamification, uh, specifically using their music platform for the younger millennial customers. So we began to break down the lead generation funnel through all of these different aspects um, and had really good success. Uh, and together with a, a number of different things, including a new savings proposition and a new stack from cloud all the way up to the front end, pleased to say that in 2020, for the first nine months, we've actually grown about a thousand percent. So data and analytics certainly does pay. If I can ask for the next slide. So um, we have absolutely benefited from uh, partnering with uh, Singapore government entities. Uh, we've actually retrained a lot of our people um, and we've rolled out a, a number of different aspects that enhance the customer experience. This is just a few examples here. But again, plugging in with PayNow, payments is a enabler, right? So if you make it really easy for a customer to transact, uh, if you make it really easy for us to validate your identity, um, that just makes online commerce that much easier. Uh, but again, it is absolutely linked with uh, our analytics capability and it's gotta be lined up with your particular business strategy. Next slide, please. These are just a couple of uh, examples. We, we've had the benefit of working with IMDA. We were the first insurer actually to, to work with them to help get us into the cloud. Um, we are a quite a legacy business and I assure you uh, because we have even within Singapore about a million customers it's a lot of data to move. It needs a lot of, of capability. And word of uh, advice for those that are beginning to embark on this journey, cloud is incredibly enabling. It allows us to collect and organize more data than we could have ever have imagined. We had business runs that used to take two to three weeks on a PC. Once it's into the cloud, it takes seconds. Now that's fantastic, but also running uh, programs on the cloud is not cheap. Uh, we had initial burst of enthusiasm with our actuaries that didn't stop running any models because they could get more information out of it than they ever could before. And actually our cloud bills went through the roof. So there does need to be a bit of a governance around that. Um, but we, we have the benefit in Singapore of more programs. And I think I, I, I can honestly say across the region, but probably well beyond globally uh, in all, all of our markets, Singapore offers the most support in terms of modernizing business through digital and training. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm gonna to get to probably um, the, the, the crux of, of the question that Michael was asking. Um, I, can, I can probably admit that Aviva was one of the earlier movers in our industry in, in fully embracing digital. And we had the benefit of a board that understood we needed to separate uh, Aviva digital from the traditional business side. Uh, in order for that sort of room and breathing space uh, th for the innovation to happen. Um, but I, I can say without doubt that the biggest leadership challenge for me was making sure that the culture uh, was able to embrace the change. And this does require a lot of open communication and a lot of leadership. 
So uh, one of my favorite examples is at the beginning, right at the very beginning in 2015, 16, I had to hire a chief designer and, and we were lucky enough to get somebody that was living in LA working for a gaming company to come and join us in cold and dark London, certainly in the winters. And um, when I asked Charles why he wanted to join, his answer was, well, right now I'm spending my days, yes, I live on a beach, but I spend my days building superpowers for people to play a fictional war online. And I want to apply my skills to build superpowers so that customers can manage their financial needs online. And, and for me, that was the, the question and answer that nailed it for me. Um, and we brought in some really inspirational talent from a broad array of digital, digital native companies, Google, Amazon included, Tencent, ByteDance included, et cetera. And when those folks come in, they expect a certain business paradigm. Um, and even though we had our own digital garage, we had nimble working processes, um, we had a massive clash of culture when our insurance colleagues intersected with our digital colleagues. And the insurance side felt very threatened. They felt that they weren't part of the, of the new sexy digital thing. And you know, they, their natural defenses popped up. They used acronyms that only insurance folk would understand. Um, they really you know, exhibited a set of behaviors that were what I coin organizational tissue rejection. Um, and it really does require leadership. It requires a lot of time, a lot of mediation to make sure that priorities are aligned, that conversations are productive, that projects are genuinely collaborative. Um, this cannot be delegated um, right at the beginning until it's embedded into a refreshed approach of working, until the new trust elements are built. It needs leadership from the top. And the board needs to say the right things. The CEO needs to be personally engaged. And whoever is responsible for digital has to spend the time and get into the nuts and bolts and the detail. So if there's one bit of learning I leave with all of you, that would probably be the main thing. Um, and so what happens at the end of it? Well, if I just use Aviva Singapore as an example, proud to say that although we had a little bit of pent up demand over the you know, first half of the year with all the COVID lockdowns, August was probably one of our best months on record. Um, and a lot of it was partially due to digital ena enablement. Uh, some of it was due to new propositions that we launched. And some of it was, of course, people again, being much more aware of what we offer. Um, but done right, done efficiently and done properly, I think um, it, it absolutely does validate uh, the investment can be a very good return on investment. So thank you, Michael. I think those are the, the main comments I'd like to make and I'll pass it back to you. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for a very comprehensive overview of your journey. And I really like the points you made around kind of uh, using purpose as a way to engage stakeholders and to attract talent and also being able to build trust across the you know, different segments of the stakeholders that you have. I think that's a very nice bridge uh, to our second panelist for today. I'd like to uh, introduce Ms. Janet Young, who is the MD and Head of Group Channels and Digitalization at UOP. So Janet is a member of the senior leadership team and has been leading di delivery channels, digitalization initiatives, customer experience and advocacy to achieve UOB Group's vision of a premier regional bank in Asia Pacific. She champions collaborative business models, omni-channel strategy to drive better customer experience and outcomes for the bank and its customers in the digital age. Uh, Janet brings more than 25 years of banking and treasury experiences and serves as a board member for several organizations, including the National Council of Social Services, uh, as well as being on the advisory board of uh, Nanyang Business School and the NUS School of Computing and Technology. Now, I'd like to invite you know, um, Janet to speak from her perspective as someone who's leading change at you know, UOB, which is such a well-known local company, you know, deep roots, very long history. And as a senior leader, can you share with us how your company is navigating this new normal and how are you transforming the incumbent businesses to better serve consumers in this new age? And what's the role of digital in it? I think particularly interested to hear about 
how to drive change and ability and agility in a big incumbent that already has a very well established business. Uh, thank you, Janet. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Michael, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think the you can bring up my cover slide as I speak through, uh, Michael. So the things that you have thrown at me, right? Uh, navigating the new normal. Um, uh, talking about business transformation to drive uh, and better serve customers, role of, role of digital and the experience of uh, driving change. I could take an entire afternoon, but I think there have been several points that uh, Chris have touched on. I think the most important thing I want to make at this, uh, at this juncture is that uh, with digitalization, with COVID and with Industry 4.0, many of the businesses and individuals have been in this last six months forced by circumstances to just adopt digital. I, I think that uh, we had the benefit, I think at UOB, to look at the entire process as a business transformation, asking ourselves the questions of why, 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 why do we need a bank? People say you need banking but may not need a bank, right? And asking ourselves what what are the markets? What are the segments? What are the customers that are still you know, relevant in this place that you'll be called home? Uh, we have been 85 years old, operating in 19 markets, uh, with big tech, fintechs, all attacking this uh, universe of banking, coming into banking uh, universe. Do we still have the ability to say that we have uh, the right to win? We have the right to be able to you know, work with our customers in the way they live, they play and they bank. Uh, and I think then, you know, it goes back down to if we have looked at the role of a financial intermediary, a lot of people are going into banking, into payments, into lending. But when we get into the role of financial custodian as the safekeeper, as the party that looks after the safety, the soundness, the security, as well as help our customers grow their wealth, grow their assets, grow their business, and grow the way they want to, you know, fulfill their own uh, goals, whether you're an individual or businesses. I think four years ago, not so different from Chris, UOB took the approach of doing a full business transformation. Yi Chong himself, together with the full nine yards of appointing a big bracket consultant, happens, Michael, to be BCG, and the whole leadership team, 16 of us, worked through that transformation journey and left no part of the bank unturned. We took the opportunity to revalidate, to review, and to look for opportunities, not just looking at fixing the gaps, not just looking at taking a digital solution and say, okay, I have a digital bank, just like others are forming digital banks and MAS is giving digital bank license, but truly going back to asking ourselves, why do we do what we do? And over here, I'm going to share, you know, a couple of the insights around uh, why the journey is not always so easy, but is a journey that I feel businesses in Singapore, in the region, in ASEAN, where UOB is very, very large, when we revalidate it and we find that in this era of globalization, but there are trade tensions going on, all the more business connectivity and individuals who seek opportunities to look for their ability to grow beyond their own shores will require banks like ourselves to connect them, to help them, and to advance not just their financial well-being, but their personal well-being. So you see that the example that I've used in the consumer space is the space that actually many businesses in the room uh, attending this seminar who do a B2C model can relate. I think in the, in the attempt of transformation, when we revalidated, you know, the why, the what, then we come to the how, it became obvious to us that in this digital world, we need to be able to ensure that you tap and leverage on ecosystem partners. So you have to integrate, integrate the way 
a financial intermediary. So banking, what does banking you know, entail? Pay, collect, you lend, you borrow, you help people to invest, you help people to transact, you help people to safe keep. You know, all these transactions that we do, which is the financial intermediary role of, uh, of UOB and as a bank, is now being embedded into how people live. When people need to buy a home, when people want to buy a home, today, what's the most important thing on their mind? Their mind is, can I get enough funding? Do I qualify for a big enough loan to buy my choice home? Take that uncertainty away. Take that uncertainty away by giving them an online calculator, a valuation model, and giving them instant approval. More than 30% of our customers who go online to apply get an instant approval immediately and therefore understand, ha, huh, I can afford to buy these three types of properties before they go out there to negotiate. So integrating banking in customers' top lifestyle priorities is in what I would say in Chinese, yi si zu xing. When you are able to think through how you live, how you work, how you commute, how you pay, how you how you look at the big picture items like you know buying a home to the small but daily items like having you know electricity in your in your at your home and again because it's a B two C world the world of marketplaces we find that many of our consumers in the process of looking at things. They have this habit because we studied their habit of discovering online. They will check, they will compare, they will try to find the best deal. So for us, this is the way that we make banking safer, simpler, and more convenient, right? Why let the customer go through surfing six, seven, eight, nine, ten utility providers, right? I mean, whether you have to look at Sunset, uh, Diamond Electric, and or our, you know, Sing Power, we can aggregate all of that. One online utility marketplace, the first that we've put across was because we understand customer love, the ability to compare, to price discover and find the most suitable. If you go on there, you can actually check what's the best deal for you. If you want to spend a certain amount, you like a fixed plan, a, a, a variable plan. These are the insights, the insights of being able to study consumers at close range because of data and data analytics. This is the beautiful world of digital. So by integrating banking into our customers' top lifestyle, be it dining, be it travel, and wanting to make it safer, simpler, and more convenient, we, as we studied the whole business transformation, we took the approach that it's not just to fix the gaps, not just to fix digitalization, not just to digitize and like Chris said, don't digitize an inefficient process, but truly look at also the opportunities, the opportunities that would come about. And in doing so, we found and the opportunity that to reach a digital generation, a segment of customers that we call the digital savvy. Right? I mean, you'll be just like many of the organizations like 80 over years old, we're not born digital. We're not a digital native. And many of the companies that are attending this uh, seminar as well, you know, if you are more than 30, 40 years old, your history and, and with a great tradition, you're not born digital, but you have to become digital. And if your business model require you to go into a segment of customers who are digitally savvy, look at the cheerful, you know, iconic look of uh, our digital bank called Tomorrow, TMRW, right? It is the bank for digital generation. It looks so different from UOB Mighty, our all-in-one, you know, lifestyle payment app that allows you to pay, bank, you know, book, dining, uh, and travel, and AVEX, and, and so on and so forth. So we looked at it and we said, what does a digital bank do for us? It helps us to acquire at scale. It helps us to reach out to this digital generation that's mobile first, digital first, and they look at life very differently. They like to be able to take charge of their, their own destiny and be able to work on how much they can save, how much they can spend, and their goals. Is it to travel? Is it to study? Is it to get married? Is it to you know have a, a beautiful home or go to the beachfront and enjoy you know one year of sabbatical? You know, so all of these things that we do is to give the customers freedom of choice. You can look at this and ask UOB, 
when we did our business transformation, what was the key thing, you know, we we kind of uh, uh, come upon when we look at, you know, the, the, the why, the what and the how. It was clear to us that our customer segment in this whole Asia Pacific where it's big for us, is largely in the consumer, in the SME, in the corporate space. This remains unchanged. And for us, the market that we play in, we're a big ASEAN bank, we're a big SME bank. It is going to be important for us to continue this and to build on this. So when we look at all these, we looked at the opportunity that digital can bring for us. We do not have a lot of very young you full customers. Probably a lot of people associate the bank with businesses and businessmen tends to be in the past, you know, the 40, 40 50 year old, you know, uh, Tauke. And so therefore, for us to reach out to the second gen, to, for us to reach out to the generation of tomorrow, we need to be able to launch this digital bank. We launched it in Thailand to great success. And this year we launched it in Indonesia. Right. So in doing so, I want to be able to encapsulate that in the consumer space, most of the ability that digitalization brings to our total business transformation is the ability to tap on new opportunities and being able to validate that with the understanding of customer insights, we know the needs that they have. The needs of wanting to have convenience, of choice, of being omnichannel, do what they want, when they want, how they want, and you know, uh, having in-person advice, having the human touch, as well as having digital, gives them the best of both worlds. Our omni-channel customers are 2.2 2 times more profitable than our digital customer. Our omni-channel customers is 1.5 times more profitable than a, than a traditional customer who just use our branches and call center. So, so that's one of the aspect of being able to tap on opportunities. Next slide, please. I, I want to be able to say that, you know, with the SME world, it, the story is not so different. With the SMEs, which is a huge segment for, for UOB, we brought digitalization to our business customers because most of the times, and in every survey, even in the most recent survey that we did in May this year, in the midst of COVID, with Accenture and Dun & Bradstreet, we realized that the biggest concern, the biggest top of mind for SMEs are cash flow. This has always been perennially, you know, the key thing that worries them. It is still in the midst of COVID. But the second big thing that came about is to manage cash flow during this period is circuit breaker in Singapore, it's MCO order in Malaysia, it is some degree of curfew in Thailand, there's certain degree of lockdown in Indonesia, and of course in China, you know the story. In this entire, you know, ASEAN or Asia context, we found that in the survey across, uh, we took the ASEAN survey, a thousand SMEs, we found that SMEs tell us that 77% of them finds that the way to manage cash flow is to improve efficiency through greater use of technology. And therefore, it vindicates the fact that, you know, three years ago when we did our business transformation, when we looked at the whole segment, we said we cannot just be to the SMEs, just giving them loans, giving them AVEX, giving them deposits, giving them accounts and giving them transactional banking. We need to be able to go beyond banking. We need to be able to go beyond and help them because unlike many of the bigger companies, SMEs do not have the resources, they may not have the time, they may not have the human capital to be able to help themselves to go through a full business transformation. And so therefore, we have early on, in three years ago, started the journey of bringing UOB BizSmart, a cloud-based integrated business solution to help SMEs manage their business digitally. This, we do not make money. We don't collect a single cent of all the SAP that power BizSmart. We do not collect a single cent of the HR easily, you know, payroll tool that goes into BizSmart. The main thing for us over here is the same. The purpose why we exist is to help our customers be successful. Bringing digitalization to our business customers where they need it, where they themselves can be empowered, where they become smart and smarter, and that where they can themselves have a seamless integration between their POS, their online website, uh, if they have an e-commerce checkout point, having the APIs to be able to port it, let them have the ability to start gathering data, being able to study data, being able to accept 
you know, uh, QR, SGQR, pay now, prompt pay, whatever the, the, the thing is in Singapore is pay now, corporate pay now, being able to collect using M collect invoicing on the go, being able to connect to trade platforms so that they can actually trade and being able to help them manage their business on the go, real time in mobile, right? All of these things are crucial. And this is the customer insight that we gained that most of the SMEs do not know how to get started to digitalize. They, like ourselves in UOB, we have to get started by forming a huge transformation team, really with the cadence, with the with the robust discipline of meeting once a month, top team. Yi Chong himself chairs it. Top team. No, nobody, you know, kind of uh, get excuses. And then within every week, people start changing the way they work. Agile teams, business technology sitting together to work through all the different streams to help, in this case, SMEs go digital. Of course, we are lucky in Singapore, we have partners like IMDA, uh, ESG, that goes about promoting, supporting, and providing the avenue, the platform, for us to take part and be part of the community. And in this case, I show an example. In the case of uh, COVID, it was apparent that even the businesses, the SMEs, who prefer to do things, same old, same old business as usual, they embraced and they said, you know, I need to go on digital so that, you know, as an F&B, I will not have circuit breaker destroy my business. I have the ability to really have an in-store contactless ordering and also an omni-channel digital. So, so this is also the, the thought process. And I come to my last slide which is the most important part I feel about the digital transformation and also about the last question you asked me about the experience of driving change and, uh, and how to have agility. I think it's about the people element. It is about the people element. I've shown a lot of uh, uh, faces over here pre-COVID. We did a lot of digital clinics for SMEs. In, in fact, we, we collaborated uh, hugely with IMDA, we did a lot of digital clinics for our seniors as well. Because ultimately, ultimately, digital natives, the converted, will embrace digital. And the same thing with our own staff in UOB. We have 26,000 people spread across 19 countries. And in Singapore, we have, we have close to 8,000 people. And if we do not, you know, find the way to ensure that our own people embrace, learn, get inspired, by it and we do not consistently communicate to them about the need of upskilling, reskilling. How can they convince you know our customers to get on the journey, to help to teach our customers, educate our customers, and continually find ways to show our customers the way? And of course, now that it is uh, COVID, it is now turned to you know online workshops and webinars. We ourselves we invested in a uh, in FinLab together with uh, IMDA's uh, no uh, IIPL the uh, Infocom um, uh, JV in the past to help fintechs adopt digital, help fintechs go into you know my minimum viable product. But three years ago, we pivoted and found that the way to help you know uh, tech startups and the way to help SMEs is to put them together and to you know use FinLab to help the process of getting SMEs adopt digital because they need to embark on change management, business transformation, upgrade and upskill their staff, bring their customers, bring their staff. So the people element has to be incorporated. So if I want to end the so-called my, my sharing, I think start from making sure that we take the opportunity, small, medium, big businesses, to transform holistically. If you can afford, use a facilitator. If you do not want to use a facilitator, really, you know, drive that change from the very top. If you need help, there are many, you know, organizations, chambers of commerce, industry, you know, verticals that are here, you know, and we ourselves in FinLab do that as, as well. Many of the avenues to help you on that journey, but be committed, stay connected to the customers, really find out the purpose and understand what they need and why you, you should, you know, have a place, you know, in their lives. And I think with that, bring your people along and I think, you know, this whole digital journey will be a worthwhile one, as we have found in UOB. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, thanks so much, Janet. Um, thanks for a very comprehensive sharing, too. And um, I really liked, you know, how you 
uh, talk about people. And I think that is a very nice bridge to uh, introduce our third panelist. Our third panelist is Dr. Michael Fang. He is the Deputy Chief Executive, uh, Chief Human Resource Officer, and <laughs> Chief Data Officer at SkillsFuture Singapore. So he's responsible for overseeing the development of the continuing education and training system in Singapore through managing funding and contractual partnerships with uh, private training providers, institution of higher learnings and enterprises. He oversees the HR function uh, and is a very strong champion for data capabilities, governance and reporting practices at SSG. And he's also an adjunct senior fellow at the Singapore University of uh, Technology and Design. And I thought this is a you know, nice uh, time in the panel to change gears a little bit. So we've heard a lot about you know, businesses, and how they're transforming, putting customers first. But at the end of the day, I think it all boils down to people. And we know that technology is creating a lot of uncertainty and insecurity amongst the workforce, right? Um, I think COVID-19 decreases the transparency that's out there. So I would like to you know, ask uh, Michael, what's your view about the new normal in terms of skills upgrading and training uh, besides the hard skills that are often discussed, can you share your perspectives around what are some of the important soft skills and mindsets that people need in order to thrive ahead? And what's the government doing in terms of preparing our youth for work in the future? Uh, thank you. Handing over to Michael, please. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, first off, I want to thank uh, SBF, Minkit, and your team for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm very honored to be here together with my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, and I also want to congratulate uh, Chris and Janet, you know, for the amazing transformation journey we've heard from you that Aviva and UOB has gone through. It's inspiring. Uh, and I think uh, more can be done to help other companies, including the small medium enterprises, to undertake that transformation journey as well. And uh, Janet, you know, we've been also working with UOB on reaching out to the uh, your SME customer uh, pool to help them to embark on skills future initiatives. Uh, so in my sharing here, uh, I would, can we bring up the slides please? Yes, thank you. Uh, so in my sharing here, I would like to uh, maybe share with uh, the audience some perspectives on how we see the new normal and how we see customers and individuals uh, being able to navigate uh, the challenges of the new normal. If we take a look at the uh, um, next, next slide, okay, all right. If we take a look at the past decade or so, it is quite clear, it's uh, evident in our day-to-day -day lives that disruptions have been happening. Uh, take for example, food and beverage. As early as uh, the turn of you know, 2010 and 2012 or so, we've seen the growth of online delivery, online ordering, use of social media channel to increase reach to consumers uh, and the growth of uh, uh, platforms like GrabFood, uh, Food Panda, and so on, Deliveroo. Uh, and that has actually changed the way the uh, food and beverage sector has been delivering to customers. Those who have not gone on digital have been left out of their growth. Uh, and particularly during this COVID times, the retailers, that re so not retailers, sorry, food and beverage outlets that have uh, provided online deli delivery services have actually seen tremendous growth. In the last three years or so, we've seen online delivery swell to about uh, 3,500 uh, outlets, uh, about 1.5 million users today, uh, and this is uh, quite evident uh, as we as we think about our day-to-day -day, uh, consumption patterns as well. Uh, and about in the, around 2013, we've seen the growth of ride-hailing services, Grab, Uber, uh, Uber's out now, but uh, GoJack and so on. Uh, and this has also transformed how the transportation industry has uh, evolved. Uh, at the initial outset, taxi drivers, traditional tra taxi drivers were affected. Taxi companies had fleets that were uh, laying, to, uh, uh, laying idle for some time, where uh, the private hire drivers increased to something like 70,000 of them by 2017. So huge growth, a change in the way consumers uh, interact with uh, trans transport provision. Uh, but again, we have seen adaptations to that. Taxi drivers have... Uh, some of them have come on, the, on these platforms. Taxi companies themselves have transformed to offer more convenient access uh, through apps and so on. So we've seen that disruption as well. 
And retail clearly has gone through disruption. Uh, Omnichannel uh, fulfillment uh, and use of online uh, purchase methods that has increased sharply, especially during COVID. Uh, and so again, if you're a retailer that has, you have an omnichannel strategy, you have online fulfillment uh, um, uh, methods, then you would have uh, participated in that growth. Uh, and of course, COVID, we are now facing uh, the COVID disruptions and clearly uh, this has impacted many sectors, almost all sectors, and the scale of the impact is quite wide. So I suppose the, uh, the key message is that disruptions really is not new. We have been having disruptions all this time, but with COVID, I think that has now brought the need to transform right in our face. It's either transform and survive as a business transform and be able to retain your job or go on to jobs that are still in demand, or uh, you might actually end up, uh, you know, down in the, um, in the, in the, in, with the companies and the individuals that may have lost their jobs and lost their businesses. Now, if any of you out there in the audience think that you could sit tight and wait for COVID to blow over, that we'll go back to the great swinging times pre-COVID, uh, as Minister Chan has put it, and I fully agree with him, you have to think again. I think the new normal is going to be very different. And if we're not thinking about how we're transforming our businesses, if we're not thinking about how do we remain employable, uh, we're going to let the disruption truly disrupt our lives. But instead, I think we can take this disruption as an opportunity to grow to the new normal and what it, what it uh, promises, uh, the opportunities that it promises. So I think disruption is here to stay and perhaps it's going to be even more frequent in the years ahead and we need to transform we need to be resilient to be able to survive and to adapt well and to do that we need the necessary skills i think both chris and J uh, and janet you've talked about reskilling of your workforce uh, and your customers as well and i think that's critical to be able to equip our ourselves to be able to uh, do that transformation So I wanted to share with you some examples. What we've seen, uh, and what we've heard from Chris and Janet, you know, inspiring stories. Uh, but maybe, you know, for those of you in the audience, some of you from SMEs, you're thinking, you know, Aviva is a big company, UOB is a big company, lots of resources. They were able to invest. They had uh, the vision. Uh, how am I going to make that transformation journey? But I want to share with you three stories that are, you know, SMEs in, in the Singapore context that has uh, really, they have really got, uh, gone through a transformation journey. And I think it's heartening to see that. Um, some statistics to share with you. Uh, with uh, COVID uh, hitting us, I think I have some stats here. Some 600 retailers have uh, joined online platforms. Those were not already there. 50,000 new businesses have adopted PayNow um, and something like 10,000 food and beverage outlets have taken up online delivery. So it is heartening to see that actually transformation is happening. There was a question in the uh, Q&A box, you know, how do we know if we are transforming and uh, are things uh, turning out right? So some of these stats actually give us some assurance that transformation is indeed happening. And it's heartening to see that because only by transforming can we stay resilient and be able to uh, do better as we go towards a new normal. So on the left box here, that's Namho Travel. Uh, they were, you know, arguably one of the more successful uh, travel agents in Singapore. Um, but as you know, with COVID, travel grounded to a halt. Right? And so now they have to face the um, uh, inevitable, which is if you don't transform, then your business really goes down. But they took the uh, bold step, they transformed, they upskilled the, uh, they reskilled their staff uh, in WSQ training and so on. Uh, and now they've gone into providing virtual tours, online shop shopping, uh, in providing uh, snacks and produce purchases uh, to beyond the, our borders. So I think that was a, a, a great adaptation by Namho Travel. The picture in the middle is Surtec. Uh, it's one of our precision engineering company used to supply metal parts for semi-con uh, manufacturers. Uh, and again, with the global pandemic, but also with the international trade tensions, they had seen a plunge in their sales. Uh, and they have transformed to instead uh, repurpose their facilities to provide plastics parts for healthcare purposes. And as we know, healthcare equipment has, uh, the demand has gone through the roof uh, in recent times. Uh, and by investing in technology and reskilling the staff, they are now able to secure new contracts uh, that you know, 
keeps them in business uh, in a very good growth path. And the right hand side, that's the uh, Chinese wedding shop uh, in, during COVID-19, the circuit breaker, clearly they weren't able to operate. Uh, weddings were held in a very tight fashion. Uh, even now, I think there are restrictions. So they suffered something like 50% revenue not loss. Uh, but they managed to trans transform, embrace digital technologies. They did online consultations over Zoom uh, and revamped their uh, website and outreach to, employee, uh, to uh, customers. And uh, with that, they've actually seen increase, almost a tenfold increase in, in inquiries and they've translated that to sales. So three encouraging stories of how local businesses have um, actually transformed and, and um, doing well in, in this current climate. So I think as a, as a whole, we have seen some very encouraging stories uh, that demonstrates the resilience of our businesses. And I think we can and will overcome this crisis with all of us uh, uh, taking that uh, same transformation journey. And those of you who know, even uh, Ge Thai singers, right, those uh, have transformed. Uh, a notable one has transformed to offer live streaming, live commerce. For those companies who are despairing, I think don't despair. Uh, take action, take, take uh, inspiration from these stories. Uh, and there will be a way uh, with, with support from government, with support from leading companies like UOB, uh, there's a way to transform your businesses. Now we talked a, a little bit about skills, what kind of skills is needed for transformation. Uh, and there are many different technical skills for different job roles uh, that we have defined in our skills frameworks. But today I just want to share two sets of skills that we see as being particularly relevant to uh, all companies during this time of transformation and COVID. Uh, one is what we call the critical core skills. So these are 16 skills grouped into three areas. Um, and as we think about how do we help employees overcome fear of uh, digitalization, fear of transformation, these critical core skills, I think it's uh, very important. So there are a set of skills around th thinking critically, how to see connections and opportunities, uh, problem solving and so on. Uh, skills around interacting with people, how to collaborate, how to influence others. Uh, skills around staying relevant, uh, having the uh, ability to think about adapting to change, managing oneself and so on. Uh, and these would all build towards a mindset that will embrace change that will help to navigate uncertainty and help us to innovate. So we embed these critical core skills in uh, our various training programs that we support. Uh, and from a company perspective, uh, we encourage you to think beyond just delivering the technical skills in whatever training uh, that you might be supporting your employees to undertake, but also focus on these critical core skills uh, that will help our employees to be more resilient and adaptable. On the digital side, some of the in-demand skills that we've seen in recent times would include things like digital marketing, uh, electronic commerce, uh, electronic transactions, uh, cloud services that Chris mentioned, that's, uh, that's a big area, data analytics, cybersecurity, and so on. So there are a whole range of training programs that we support that's offered by our institutes of higher learning, our private training providers, uh, and our leading enterprises uh, that have come forward to provide training in some of these emerging skills areas. So as we think about resilience of our businesses and resilience of an individual's career, of the employee, our employees' careers, it, what's critically important is mindset, right? the people issue that Jenna talked about. Uh, starting with the mindset, building up the soft skills, building up the technical skills, and that will give us a confidence to be able to navigate the COVID disruption and future disruptions. As many of you would know, and uh, also mentioned briefly by Minister Chan, uh, the government, Singapore government has put aside tremendous amount of resources to help companies, to help individuals, to build up the skills, to be resilient, and to be able to uh, navigate the uncertain times. So we do acknowledge that COVID is a difficult period, but it's also a period for us to look at how to build new capabilities within our companies and for ourselves. So we've involved multiple stakeholders uh, beyond our training partners. We've also been working with the unions, uh, the sector, sectoral agencies, leading companies, and we we'll launched a range of programs 
under the uh, SG United Jobs and Skills uh, program. And the intent is to help those who are displaced to find jobs, to find uh, internships, um, traineeships, uh, training, uh, and train and place opportunities uh, to help them to build up the skills to be able to get jobs. For sectors that have been severely affected by COVID, we've also rolled out the enhanced training support package to uh, seven sectors currently. And this helps companies to be able to take the allow time uh, for the, in, within these sectors to be able to send employees for additional training uh, with general support by the government. Here's a, another list uh, of support initiatives under Skills Future that would be relevant for enterprises. Uh, and uh, say, for example, the Skills Future Enterprise Credit. This is uh, targeted at helping companies to approach their transformation journey holistically. Um, and uh, you can use uh, the, your Skills Future Enterprise Credit uh, for uh, adopting technology solutions, for sending employees for training, for redesigning jobs, and so on. There's a range of uh, work study programs where uh, we have enterprises working with our training institutions to be able to uh, build a pipeline of talent. Uh, programs such as uh, Skills Future for Digital Workplace for your employees to be able to be equipped with basic digital literacy and have the confidence to be able to embrace change. Uh, and for those of you who find that there's so many initiatives, you don't know where to start, we have the Skills Future Jumpstart Workshop we will give you an overview of the range of initiatives that uh, would be relevant uh, for your company. Uh, you can also self-help on the Enterprise Jobs and Skills Portal. The QR code and the web link is on the top right of the page. Um, and I just want to address uh, a feedback that we hear quite frequently from uh, the anecdotal feedback we hear from companies and individuals. Um, the, the, the feedback goes like this. You know, Times are so challenging for my business. Times are so challenging for my career and job. Why do I need training? You know, I've lost my job. Uh, my business is, uh, is, is, being, is coming under pressure. Why do I need training? Now, I can understand that perspective. Now, training is not for its own sake. We have to think again. If we don't have the skills to transform, then truly we may lose our jobs for a long period of time and our businesses may not survive. So as part of transforming our businesses, we need to be able to have the skills to improve our chances that we can transform successfully. And similarly for individuals, have the skills to increase your chances to be able to get a job. So this is why we have this range of training related support measures to help our companies and support them uh, as they think about how to move their businesses to help individuals to think about how do they move on to jobs that are still in demand. Um, thanks, thanks so much, Michael. Yes, let me just conclude. Sharing. Yeah, I just said for, so for, for, for short points uh, to conclude. So I think that our key message is that disruptions has become the new norm. Now it's the time to transform and we need to build new capabilities and skills and the uh, government and skills future is here to support you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, looks like we're running a little bit over time and I think what I'd like to do is uh, quickly invite our fourth panelist, Mr. Jason Lee, who is the founder of uh, La Perfumery, to share his perspective. So as a quick introduction, so Jason founded the company in 2014 and he's responsible for product development, marketing, sales and technology. And prior to founding uh, La Perfumery, he actually only spent four years in Jivaldan before he you know, had the courage to go out and really start his own business. Uh, beyond just having a retail presence in Singapore, he's also been very instrumental in helping to drive La Perfumery to focus on commercial opportunities and to customize fragrances for some of the really well-known brands such as Fullerton Hotel, Singapore Airlines, etc. Um, Jason, so we've heard from you know, the government, we've heard from some of the bigger companies with long history, but as an you know, entrepreneur, as a new company, can you tell us a little bit more about what your new normal is looking like and how you're helping uh, your company and your staff to uh, adapt to the new normal? And what are some of the reflections you have on your entrepreneurial journey during this very challenging time? Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Michael. And uh, very good morning to everyone. 
It is indeed a great honor to be here sharing my experiences and views. And uh, on the first slide, please. I will first share about my experiences in this new normal. And then on the next slide, I will then share about how we adapted in serving our customers and looking after our people. The reality of this new normal really came in uh, during circuit breaker when it was enforced in April this year. Our retail outlets could not operate and we saw a huge surge in our online orders. Fortunately, in Feb this year, we were quick to adapt and started manufacturing our own sanitizers. Being essential, we were lucky enough to be allowed to operate during the circuit breaker, but we were limited to only a few hit counts. It was indeed a logistic nightmare, especially when our fulfillment partners were also facing manpower shortages. And then we transitioned to phase two in June. And to safeguard everyone's safety, it is mandatory for everyone to wear face masks everywhere we go. There were to be no blotters, no testers allowed. And basically we had all our products clean wrapped in stores. So being a fragrance company, it was really difficult. And today we are exactly five months from the announcement of Circuit Breaker. We see a clear shift in consumer preferences. But it used to be a 50-50 between the perfumes and the home fragrances segment. But now we see a 90% leaning towards the home fragrances and only 10% on body perfumes. Not surprisingly, because everyone is working from home right now and people tend to spend significantly less time outside. We have since focused on this segment and will continue to foray into essential oils and natural disinfectants. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So here we talk about how we have been adapting in serving our customers and looking after our people. I shall summarize this with two R's, being relevant and being resilient. Being relevant will relate more to the hardware, while being resilient will relate more to the software. Let's touch on the hardware first. And all thanks to the various grants offered by IMDA, WSG, Enterprise Singapore, we've managed to upgrade our current systems. For example, payroll, RFID, inventory systems, CRM, POS, etc. We've tapped on PCP and PMAX grants offered by WSG to upskill and reskill our workforce. And before we move on to the next R, I would like to bring your attention to this smart AI scent ambassador that you are looking at right now. This is a work in progress with Enterprise Singapore and Afternaught, a local UX UI agency. This interface is equipped with smart recognition sensors and is able to engage in intuitive interactions with customers. It is connected to our industrial neighborizers so that customers can experience our sense while watching and listening to the relevant product media contactlessly. We hope to extend this to other categories like skincare and beauty, with the end goal of collecting and analyzing the big data so that we can bring forth better products and services to the economy. And lastly, we touch on being resilient, the software, which to me is so much more important than staying relevant. Now take the example of the fire ant you see here. And like humans, ants are social animals that work together collectively. A single ant can only do that much. However, an ant colony can find highly efficient solutions together, such as building a massive ant raft during a hurricane flooding that can ultimately save everyone. It is important for businesses and workers alike to remain positive and united. Do not be afraid to evolve and open to new ideas, to new technology. It is always important to keep up the learning and we should encourage others to do so as well. 
and don't procrastinate and be late to execute. While we are still in this recovery mode, economies are still not yet fully open, the borders are still closed, and we should make use of this time to upgrade and upskill so that when the time comes, we can be ready to ride the uptrend. Lastly, do not be afraid to employ help because like ants, we are stronger together. A big lesson learned for us from this pan pandemic is really the importance of having, having a one step beyond mindset. In everything we do, we should always think one step beyond, be it customer service, be it budgeting, be it expansion plans, etc. And with this mindset, we will have more options in any scenario. More importantly, we are also very mindful about the mental health of everyone in the organization. With circuit breaker, work from home, and all the negativity that has been going around on the news, on social media for the past few months, it is crucial to be mindful about our mental health. And we always remind the team to maintain their balance in their daily lifestyle, to have enough rest, enough water, exercise, having a good diet, and of course, spending quality time with the family. Only with this basic settled, we can then set our minds right to grow sustainably. Thank you, Michael. I shall pass back the mic to you. Thanks, thanks, Jason. Fantastic sharing. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time for Q and A's. But uh, if I would take a shot just to you know, res think about what are some of the key points that resonated with me from the sharings by the different panelists. You know, I think it's really clear as you think about digitalizing your business to be able to differentiate. You know, what's table stakes and what would be unique and differentiating for you moving forward. I think number two, a lot of our panelists have shared about really putting the customer at the front and center, putting, it, putting them and their needs at the heart of the change and really making it easy and frictionless for you to be able to serve them better. Uh, our panelists also shared a lot about using data and using different digital tools uh, better. And I think in terms of driving change, I think all of them were also extremely clear in sharing that it's important to be able to drive change from the top and also to bring your organizations and your key stakeholders uh, along with you. I hope that the stories from the panelists today uh, provide some inspiration for everybody who is listening in uh, to take action, to relook your business, to find opportunity during this crisis. Um, as Michael has shared, there's a lot of support from the government and it's important that as we change, it's also that we are also putting our people uh, at the front of many of these future developments during these uncertain times. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of the audience, register a big thanks to the panelists for making the time to share with us. And uh, I'd like to wrap up the panel here and hand the floor back to Graham to continue with the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, everybody.